where today Robert Mueller's prosecutors are expected to lay out the most detailed description yet of the criminal conspiracy that Paul Manafort, who's the president's former campaign chairman, engaged in. The scope of his crimes includes defrauding the U.S. government, covering up and lying about conversations with the Putin-aligned operative, tampering with witnesses, and misleading federal investigators after agreeing to cooperate. It's a breathtaking sweep of criminal conduct, one likely to result in Mr. Manafort spending the rest of his days in prison. But at the core, there remains unanswered questions. Why? And what, if anything, did Donald Trump know about it? Those answers might come in the sentencing memo from Mueller's team, which is due by midnight tonight. It's not clear how much of the document will be redacted to protect any ongoing federal investigations. But if news about Mueller being close to wrapping up is to be believed, this filing may be one of the final glimpses into the case Mueller has built. Also new today, NBC has confirmed that prosecutors in New York plan to bring state charges against Manafort, which would ensure that Manafort is held accountable for his crimes, even if the president pardons him. The New York Times explains, quote, the president has broad power to issue pardons for federal crimes, but no such authority in state cases. And while there has been no clear indication that Trump intends to pardon Manafort, the president has spoken repeatedly of his pardon power and defended his former campaign chairman on a number of occasions. The move by New York prosecutors marks just the latest proof point that the legal trouble for Trump world extends far beyond Mueller's reach. And that's where we start today with some of our favorite reporters and friends. Phil Rucker, White House Bureau Chief for the Washington Post, former U.S. Attorney Joyce Vance, Michael Steele, former chairman of the RNC, and NBC News national political reporter Carol Lee. Phil Rucker, let me start with you. Manafort and the criminal proceedings around Manafort have often been a trigger for this president, for this White House. He's gone out on the North Lawn and called him brave. He's described his crimes as 10-year-old tax cases. He's really been all over the map with Manafort. Any reporting on the mood there today as this sentencing memo, which other sentencing memos like the Cohen one, for example, have really yeah. rocked this White House <clears throat> when they've come out? Yeah, well, Nicole, President Trump's inclination has been to try to defend Paul Manafort. He feels sympathetic for his former campaign chairman, especially because some of the crimes that Manafort has been charged with predate the Trump campaign. And so Trump has felt some sort of uh, sympathy for Manafort there. But I have to tell you, at the moment, the bigger trigger uh, for the White House and for President Trump, according to our reporting, is, is the anticipation for the Mueller report, uh, as well as next week's public testimony by Michael Cohen. Now, White House officials will say publicly they're not concerned at all about Cohen's testimony, but that testimony promises to bring a lot of fireworks that could be very complicated for the president. And you can rest assured that the president is going to be paying close attention to it from 12 hours uh, away on the time zone out in Vietnam, where he's going to be next week for that summit with Kim Jong-un. Phil Rucker, it's a great reminder, and you've covered these foreign trips where the president's attention is anywhere but where he is. He's trying to monitor cable news coverage back at home during some of these other flashpoints. But you've just painted a pretty stunning constellation of, of flashpoints. Cohen, his former fixer, will be on Capitol Hill before three committees. I believe at least one of those open. We know how the president feels about what he possesses in terms of knowledge about Trump's conduct. He called it an attack on the nation when his offices were yeah. raided. What, what sort of preparations? I mean, there's never much other than sending Rudy out to Fox News primetime. But what preparations are underway to deal with next week? Well, Nicole, if you just look at the calendar for next week, I'm going to be on that trip, by the way, in Vietnam with Trump. And in Vietnam time, uh, he's going to have his first day of meetings uh, scheduled so far with Kim Jong-un on Wednesday. Wednesday night in Vietnam is going to be uh, the morning here in Washington when Cohen is testifying. So if Trump's going to be paying attention to that Cohen testimony, he's not going to get much sleep between his first <laughs> night of meetings with Kim Jong-un and the second day of meetings with Kim Jong-un on Thursday. Uh, it could be quite a, a split screen moment for this president with all the revelations that Cohen could potentially be making uh, in his open testimony. Oh, Joyce, what could go wrong? A sleep-deprived president meeting one-on-one -on -one with no note-takers with the North Korean dictator. I hate to think about it. But, Joyce, take us through 
this Manafort sentencing document. And I referenced the Cohen sentencing memo because that was a watershed moment in terms of this White House's understanding of the potential legal exposure that the president had in the cases out of the Southern District of New York. Why are sentencing memos an opportunity to detail and, and sort of provide us, sort of the public, with more, a narrative, more of a narrative explanation of the crimes or in Manafort's case, the criminal conspiracy that Manafort's accused of or have to, now has been found guilty of? There's a very clear legal framework. The United States Code establishes a set of factors that a judge has to consider at sentencing. And if a judge fails to consider all of those factors, the sentence can actually be overturned on appeal. So the government sentencing advocacy always explains to the judge what the available evidence is. And that can be the defendant's background, that can be the circumstances of the current offense, which is where we've often gotten broad information out of the Mueller team. It can even be information regarding crimes the defendant has not been convicted of. So there is a very broad scope to the sort of information the government can, can bring to play. And for all the redaction that we've seen in these memos, we've learned a great deal as the Manafort pleadings have been filed. For instance, this is how information regarding his late uh, meetings with Kalimnik came to light. Much of our understanding of what we would call core conspiracy type allegations, this memo, even though it will certainly be heavily redacted yet again, may actually give us additional insight and that certainly will have the White House on edge. Joyce, I want to ask you about something that Andy McCabe said to me earlier this week. I asked him, I've worked on three presidential campaigns and never had any contacts with Russians. So there's the weirdness of everyone on the Trump campaign talking to Russians and Russian aligned actors all the time. But then there's the layer of all of them then lying about those contacts. That's what Mike Flynn did, lied about contacts with Kislyak. Jeff Sessions recused because he lied about contacts with Russians. And you, and you go on down the the line. One of Manafort's uh, crimes was to lie about his contacts and conversations with Kalimnik, a, a, a Putin-aligned um, operative. Are we likely to learn how that fits into this broader picture of all of Trump's associates lying about their contacts with Russians? You know, as you point out, you only lie about things. Criminal defendants tend to lie the most about issues that they have no innocent explanation to offer for. And we've already heard from Andrew Weissman, one of uh, Mueller's prosecutors in the courtroom, that at least some of these conversations with Kalimnik are central to what's being prosecuted. I don't know that we'll learn more in this sentencing memo. We could. The interesting possibility, and we just don't know if it will come to pass or, or not, would be if there is some sort of a conspiracy indictment in the works or if the report that goes up to the Hill that goes to the attorney general first, if that's referencing conspiracy, that may the, be the point at which we learn what these conversations between Kalimnik and Manafort amounted to. Carol, I want to ask you about news today that the New York district attorney is expected to charge Manafort seemingly checkmating him. Um, but, 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 but first, on the sentencing memo, you've covered and reported extensively on what we learned, these tea leaves we glean about the Mueller probe. And as Joyce referenced, we learned in some of that testimony that was in the transcript from a closed-door hearing that at least in Andrew Weissman's mind, the contacts between Manafort and Kalimnik are, are at the center of the Mueller probe. What, what does that that sort of um, predict or, or, or foreshadow in terms of what we might see today? Well, I think we don't exactly know, but certainly anything that we would learn around that specific instance is very significant because of the way you just said that Weissman framed all of this. Um, the other thing that we learn sometimes for these memos that can be significant and open a new window is a lot of times, you know, we'll see senior campaign official one named individual and one. individual one or something along those lines. And so we could come away with some new avenue um, or person or, you know, somebody that everyone's trying to figure out who it is, um, some other piece of the web that um, leads to the Trump campaign. Um, so, you know, 
the Kalimnik th piece of this, though, is, is significant. I mean, you know, the other thing is the poll data. Like, what happened with that? You know, and what was it? And we what really was never it? Never got a lot of detail. And, right. Exactly. And so that's something also that would be really interesting if we were to learn that. But right now, we just have no idea what's and, going to be available. And what about the move from New York state charges? It's really uh, that's a problem for Paul Manafort. Obviously, look, the president, um, you know, hasn't ruled out a pardon, but he's also shown that he's willing to use the pardon power in very unconventional ways with Sheriff Arpaio, for instance, and others. Um, and must appear on Fox News with fully dyed head of hair. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, and, you know, but it does, it checkmates them. And, and New York has this double jeopardy law that's pretty intense and strong. And so what our, our understanding of things is that they would, they would find ways to get around that specifically by saying he violated state tax laws. Um, that's one way that they could get after him. But, you know, it's another example of how Paul Manafort's legal troubles are, you know, now in several different spaces. It's kind of similar to Donald Trump's legal <laughs> troubles. Um, I, I want your thoughts on all of this, but I, I, I want to add um, th this wrinkle that, that, that Phil Rucker put out there, this picture of a looming Mueller report, which will be the whole enchilada. Cohen back on Capitol Hill, a known trigger for Donald Trump. Cohen talking about covering up alleged sexual relationships that the president had. Um, and, and Paul Manafort likely to learn more than we know yet in the sentencing memo due today. All of that is not good. Uh, all of that is problematic for a president who will be on foreign soil. Uh, and I think the one thing that a lot of folks inside the White House, particularly those uh, in State Department, uh, are sort of guarding against is the president going there, being distracted, as Phil noted, uh, and basically giving away the store. <laughs> I just kind of say, yeah, whatever, you know, what, okay, whatever. It's like watching the TV and say, yeah, yeah. That, I mean, it's that kind of moment that we have to be concerned about. That's one. But two. But wait, wait, don't, let's not gloss over that because at the end of the day, whether Paul Manafort goes to jail for 30 years or 13, right. it, California won't get blown up. I mean, you, you raise a really serious point. Yeah. He's going to be, he's going to have an eyeball on the cable coverage of the Cohen testimony when, when nothing short of American national security is on the line in Vietnam. And, and to that point, uh, the other side of that very gnarly coin is the fact that the president could then also do a deal, agree to something just with all the faculties in place, knowing that it's going to be the central talk and communication uh, out of wag the White the House. And it'll be the wag the dog kind of moment coming out of uh, Young Peng. That is the biggest fear that people around, people around the president already are afraid that he's going to go in to, with North Korea and cut a really bad deal and that he won't get a lot and give away, and he will give away a lot. The chances of that happening—they read about the wall. Skyrocket. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they skyrocket if you have the president in a situation where he's meeting with Kim Jong Un, and all of that is happening, and he just really wants to change the headlines, and so he's willing to agree to something um, that otherwise would be considered a terrible deal, and just to basically pass the moment. This is something that um, we've seen him do before. And, and obviously, this is such a serious issue that it would have dire sort of consequences. And that's what people around him are afraid of. And his, and his you know, clap back on that will be, well, you guys will clean it up. You, you, we'll get back to Washington. If I said something or did something you're not happy with, just clean it up. But in the moment, here's the headline. Here's what's driving uh, our coverage throughout the day would be this, this bright, shining object that the president just pulled out of thin air uh, and is now uh, placed in the middle of the conversation. I want to ask you about a letter from Adam Schiff, an open letter to Republican colleagues. Schiff writes, many of you have acknowledged your deep misgivings about the president and quiet conversations over the past two years. You've bemoaned his lack of decency, character and integrity. You've deplored his fundamental inability to tell the truth. But for reasons that are all too easy to comprehend, You've chosen to keep your misgivings and your rising alarm private. This must end. The time for silent disagreement is over. You must speak out. Yeah. Uh, how many of us have been in those conversations with folks <laughs> who lament and bemoan and decry the, the, the sheer stuff that comes out of tweets and pronouncements and press conferences? Uh, and, and, and then when they get in front of a camera, they get in front of reporters and others, they clam up. And they say nothing. And it's, it's, it's good to see Adam Schiff saying, look, we're not going to play this game anymore. You know, it, you, your laments are falling on deaf ears from here on out. 
people yeah. don't want to hear it. And and it's a great point, Phil Rucker. And I know this White House has always um, acted sanctimonious and 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 you know tried to get on some sort of high horse when these accounts come out. Uh, but there have been a small handful. I mean, when Bob Corker came out and talked about this president is not displaying the competence for the office he holds, called the White House adult daycare. Yeah. But th they're flashpoints. Is there any sense that they're going to be more than random intermittent bursts with the giant failure and the power grab over the wall with all the misgivings from within the executive branch of the government about this summit next week and with this picture coming into focus that you described at the top of the hour on the Russia front? Is there is there any concern that someone just might take Adam Schiff's advice? <laughs> Nicole, there's sort of a daily concern that that could possibly happen, but we've seen <laughs> it over two years now, and it simply hasn't uh, very often. Bob Corker, his comments, uh, he, he's sort of a lone wolf there, him and Jeff Flake, and they're no longer in the Senate. And the mm -hmm. people currently in the Senate and currently in the House on the Republican side have simply not shown sort of a willingness to, to speak their mind about this. And, you know, we might see when the Mueller report comes out, if it's if it's damaging enough for President Trump that some Republican lawmakers could change their calculations and want to become more public with their concerns about the president's fitness for office. But we're not there yet. And the, the concerns inside the White House are not that, you know, Mitt Romney is going to come to a microphone and, and you know, speak as hard and, and talk about Trump because he at various points has has made those sorts of comments, including in that op-ed a couple months ago. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's much more about the actual sort of action. What is Mueller going to compile? What is Mueller going to re release? And what sort what are those details going to show? What is that pattern of behavior? You and I were on television together earlier this week, and, and you made a comment I wanted to ask you about ever since. For the White House, the best case scenario is that the Mueller report only, merely includes information that's politically damaging. What's on the other end of the spectrum in terms of what's keeping the White House awake at night? Well, I should point out, Nicole, that they're, they're actually the, the best case scenario that some in the White House are actually entertaining is that the Mueller report doesn't really say anything. Uh, but we know that's not a realistic scenario. So political <laughs> damage is probably the, the best case scenario based on what's real uh, and possible to come out. But the worst case scenario could be uh, could be really quite damaging. It could be, you know, Mueller presenting a, a whole list of activity, a, a body of evidence showing that the president sought to obstruct justice and just not charging him because uh, of the Justice Department guidelines, but providing uh, basically a blueprint for the Democrats in the House to, uh, to move on impeachment proceedings. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.